At the end of a long day, I don't turn to Netflix to relax. I jump on YouTube and there's only two things I watch. Either I watch a psychology lecture by Jordan Peterson or if I'm feeling really uh, frisky, I'll jump on to the Jim's group channel on YouTube. I'm talking about Jim's mowing, Jim's cleaning, Jim's dog washing, that whole deal. There's something very addictive for me about the content they produce over there. I don't know if it's because I can vicariously live through a day in the life of someone who mows lawns or, or what it is. But the, the truth is media is, new media is taking over our lives, whether it's YouTube or podcasts or this show, uh, we're all drifting away from the mainstream sources. And what we're doing today is an episode in our business innovation series where we're gonna talk about content creation. Why create content? How do we create content? And what makes good content? Why am I addicted? Joel, why am I addicted to Jim's videos? I don't get, I should tell you who I'm talking to. Joel Cleaver is the brain behind uh, the Jim's channel. So he's the chief digital officer at Jim's group and uh, he makes all of the, the content, I think. That's correct, yes. With my two videographers we have, two full-time team members on staff, Ben and Jake, who are great. And uh, they film and they just basically deal with me in Slack, just going, I want to do this, I want to do this, I want to do this, and mm. away we go. So why am I addicted? I don't know, you tell me. What do you like about it? Well, this is funny because the Jim's channel is, it's obviously it's an advertisement to, hey, this is why you should sign up for a franchise or why you should hire a Jim's mowing. Yeah. But I never feel like I'm just watching an ad and being sold to. I love watching a day in the life of, yeah, that's fantastic. Well, it's a great, it's a great point you make. And, and Jim's one of Jim's original book titles for his autobiography was "Selling by Not Selling," right. and that's the approach I tried to do it. Um, around two years ago, there's a lot of crisis in the franchising industry. A retail food group, you know, yeah. franchisees going on a current affair with the re the site based food ones getting ripped off by all these third party greedy franchisors and stuff. And there's a massive bad, you know, image around franchising. Yeah. This around two years ago, and I sort of thought. You know what can we do to, to lift the lid on this this industry? Because the way because all the content I do with Jim at the moment, I hear that stuff every day. I've been hearing it for nine years. I hear it you know in our chats after work. I've I've heard it for so long. I just thought, why don't we just capture this, put it out there, show people behind. We're not hiding anything. Mm. Be transparent and authentic as we can. Mm. And you know, and then here we are two years later. We've got you know lots of views. We've got mm. people who watch you know eight episodes of Ask Jim or they watch you know a couple of hours doing their their due diligence as opposed to reading a a pre, you know, pre-done info pack. They'll watch the video series now, or watch ten of them, and and then come to training and say, "Oh, I came here because I watched three hours gyms and just thought how open it is that the CEO does a live Facebook live show every Wednesday night." And you know, that that's what it's about. It's about transparent and authenticity in your brand, and, and especially in franchising, it lacks there. And yeah. I just thought we have to do that. Why not modernise this brand? You know, let's just unveil, you know, un take the cloth off it. Let's show the inner workings of the company. Yeah. It's not, you know, we don't we don't edit a lot of stuff down. A lot of we have a lot of long form content, and we do have a lot of short form stuff as well now. Yeah. And we're getting a lot more polished in what we do as we go. Do you cut up your long form to make the short? form? Yeah, we do. Yeah, okay. well, that's what I do. As yeah, well. yeah, Gary, Gary V. You know, that's a that's a, um, a big fan of his sort of stuff. And yeah. um, and for me, it's great. You know, you can film one hour yeah. of Ask Jim in a week. And if I, you know, during this time in the lockdown, we haven't been able to film out in the road for a long time. I've just been able to go back through our long form stuff yeah. and just go. And it's been great for that, um, you know. And Jim's Jim's really easy to work with in terms of you know being. He's a great character, yeah. a lot of good business advice, and the stuff that I've been you know putting on camera is stuff I've heard for nine years. And yeah. A lot of our franchisees and Zors have heard it, but we've never had the ability to capture it until right. the last couple of years. Yeah. yeah. So okay, you've been there for nine years yeah. doing other stuff, and you've drifted into the digital world. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so I had um I started law doing law commerce in in Warrnambool, yeah. so my hometown there. And after a couple of years, I had to move to Melbourne to do the you know, to continue doing the uni course and then uh, had a mate who was actually working at Jim's group at the time and I had no idea it was Jim's mowing or who Jim was and yeah. said, I'm working there two days a week. He goes, you should, you know, if I come back, you should take my job. I said, okay, give me the number and I kept ringing up, kept ringing up and eventually got my resume in there and I started there as a two-day-a-week law clerk. So the, the legal department back then had around eight people. Now Jim has one lawyer who works part-time. Oh, yeah. So it's gone from eight people to that. So, yeah. which I think is a great reflection of the company. Um, you know, we don't have many legal disputes, things yeah. like that. So, Started there for two days a week, and I've just then I worked in insurance there. So we yeah. had Jim's insurance, the broker chair for four years. And this is all sounding very boring compared to what you're doing now. It is. It is. <laughs> I sort of made myself a role in a way to sort of escape from doing that sort of <laughs> yeah. stuff. But yeah. um, and then the insurance for four four years, we set up in Jim's insurance. Now it's a great brokerage for our franchisees, and mm. then ran our legal documents and compliance department for a couple of years, put things in place with automations and that, and then sort of just gravitated towards our web, digital, you know, social mm. media stuff, which had nothing done to it until. 18 months, two years ago, mm -hmm. and I saw sort of stuff that we've got to take it back from this company doing it, let's just do it in-house, and 
progressively we've built, and it's taken yeah. a lot of trust as well. Um, from uh, from Jim, uh, yeah, yeah, from Jim and franchisors and Z's, and you know, I think I've, you know, I couldn't have done it coming from an outsider in starting day one and just going, I want to do this. It wouldn't right. have happened. Right. I had to have that trust, and you know, that you know, I've got some credit, you know, credits in the bank with Jim for certain things, and he, you know, he trusts me, and I, you know, I don't want to abuse that trust. So, you know, I only, only do things with him which I know are comfortable. Um, you know, I explain things, I explain why we're doing him, I show the results, and he just trusts me, and I think. What it's done unintentionally, it's definitely made him more personable to our franchisees yeah. as well. Uh, you know, th sometimes with franchisees in head office, it can be pretty scary. It's the CEO, and you know, I don't want to bother him. And you know, there's a, a facade put on in mm. stuff they do present. Whereas with this, there's no facade anymore. I think people really do know who he is now, and I think that's what any brand should do. They should any brand should do yeah, it. Yeah, any yeah. brand should do it. They should not being afraid of showing who they truly, truly are. It doesn't have to be always pre-done and just, you know, this is the marketing message yes. we want to put out there, these sort of things. I don't believe in that. I think just being who you are, showing who your brand is, and that's why things like the day in the life which you like. So good. Yeah, it's a great it's a great little, that's a Gary V direct rip-off, doing the is documenting, oh. doing documenting your day, documenting oh, your day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, so I don't know if he called it a day in the life, but, yeah. and Jim was really keen to do it. And Jim was fantastic, yeah. was in his house from 7 a.m. in the morning, yeah. does his exercise and that sort of stuff, and we go and play some squash and put yeah. some nice, you know, hip-hop music to it and, okay. Things like that, and he, but he gets it, and um, you know, it's been great for the brand. And I think you know, whilst other franchising brands are struggling, you know, we're going to hopefully after the lockdown, with the suspensions, we'll hit our four thousandth, um, what we call active franchisee or build franchisee, oh, right, right, right. moving forward for the first time ever. Okay. Um, you know, and that could be due partly to the economy, but I think it's due to, you know, yeah. how much content we're doing, and just you know, we've unveiled the you know the gym's brand uh, to the public. Well, do you think there's a desire for the for that kind of genuineness and authenticity, I do. I do. I'm yeah. I'm big on this, and I'm, I'm you know I, authenticity is the word that gets thrown around a lot. Yeah. But how many people are truly authentic? You know, everyone hmm. everyone puts a facade on when they meet someone. You know, yeah. it's it's one of those. Do you things. have a facade on now? Absolutely, and I'll probably ease my way into it. And I, as I was saying off camera, I do. I interview a lot of our franchisees and franchisors, so hmm. we can sort of see what they're you know going through when I'm talking to them. Does it um, feel pressure? You, a little bit. Do you prefer to be over here? Absolutely. It's really? so much easier asking someone and actively listening to them and then I think than uh, answering these questions because I don't think what I do is anything special. What I do is just basically replicate a lot of Gary Vee stuff, yeah. stuff that I like online. Yeah. So I take a lot of stuff from sports clubs or whatever and I try and make them work for Jim stuff. And yeah. Jim has ideas, gives me ideas, and yeah. my team members give me great ideas, Ben and Jake, and then uh, we make them happen. Yeah. yeah. But this, this stuff is... Um you say you don't do anything special, but this is where we're going. I think brands are starting to embrace. I think Gary's early. He always is. Yeah, way early. Yeah, he's always. Yeah. Uh, but this is where we're going. And even whether you're advertising yourself, like this is basically discernible as me, or you're advertising mm. gyms, mm. this this um, long form type stuff. People want to get to know people beyond those sound bites. But why do you think people are brands, especially, are scared to um, to open up like that? Well, it's a good question. Um, I had my guys. So my two guys, they were RMIT. You know, they've doing videography freelancing before and mm. they're only really young. I think Jake's 23 and Ben's 24, 25 and they're fantastic videographers and I was talking to them and I said, they sh videographers or people who do those degrees at, um, let's say, RMIT or Swinburne, which is the digital media stuff, I don't know why they struggle to get jobs because for me, a videographer for a small business or mm. a small to medium business, if you can afford it, is essential. Yeah. Documenting that day, you know, and for the cost you pay, it's relatively cheap. I'd rather spend money on making video content than SEO yeah. any day of the week, just just my opinion. Yeah. Um, but in regards to... But that's not... So, sorry, do, sorry, hold that thought, but the, you said SEO and versus videography. Videography is a long play, whereas SEO is like motivated people ready to buy now. Yeah, correct. Conversion. Correct, yeah. you know. And for me, I just think, um, you know, having... I just think video, so much traffic's video now. Um, you know, you got you can have... You can just make industry seem so much more, more interesting with video content than what you can do. But I just think brands are reluctant because everything has to be so controlled and so contrived and mm. has to go through 50 different approvals. Mm. The board members might not get it or the, mm. they might have an older gentleman in the company or whoever might not understand the whole concept of it and it nixes it you know, and kills it. But I just think people want things to be so contrived at big companies or in companies in general. Um, and I just don't think... I think people can see through that. If I see a, a video ad on, online, which is a testimonial for a product or whatever, I know it's contrived, you know. But what's that's why influencer marketing, you know, on Instagram, for example, uh, is still pretty powerful. But even that's getting a bit more contrived now. It as is well. right. You know, I'm not sure. Yeah, what's going exactly. on? Exactly. Yeah, In the yeah. early days, Instagram, you know, influencer marketing was a great tactic. Yeah. But now people, have, you know, are wary up to it, which yeah. is why even online reviews, you know, people there's know, a, right? a distrust in online reviews. So how can you get 
a genuine customer review. Can you do it via video? Can you do it via something else? Have you heard of the service recovery paradox? No, I haven't, no. So there's this theory that anyone looking at a list of reviews, if it's all positive, they distrust it, which is, okay, yeah. of course. Yeah. But if you have a couple of bad ones in there and you see the proprietor jumping on and fixing it, like, so sorry, we heard you had that experience, email us, we'll send you a new, pro whatever. That rates higher in people's trust than in all good reviews. Yeah, It's better to have some bad ones come through. So because of the service recovery paradox, some companies are actually actively looking to get some bad reviews in if they don't have any. Okay. And then and my wife's got a small business. And right. I'm like, find a bad review. You've only got 15 good reviews. We need a bad one. And she's yeah. why? Because we need it there and we need you to recover it. And then this is from a, a professor of marketing here in Melbourne. Mm. Uh, Dr. Brent Coker, check out. He's a very good follow on LinkedIn. Uh, yeah, interesting, eh? Yeah, absolutely. But I just think, you know, brands, just so much, they just want to be kind of contrived and controlled. Mm. Whereas I think if they just show who they are, you know, show show what the average CEO's day like, you know, what's the actual inner workings of the company. You know, you build that connection with the potential customers or people who are researching you. They see a couple of videos online behind the scenes and they think, oh, that's pretty cool and genuine. And it doesn't have to be well produced at all. It could be a phone. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. The whole, this whole thing really started with an April Fool's joke back in, Back in the day, I think I had like 10,000 views, I whipped out my phone, we had no cameras whatsoever. And, and this is the, when the video sort of really hit home yeah. with, um, you know, we need to really do this stuff, was basically we done an April Fool's prank saying that Jim's just bought, you know, a King Island and he's renamed it Jim Island. And um, we filmed that, we put it on, on our Facebook page, yeah. and had like eight to 10,000 views and yeah. get had a call, I think, from his wife saying, you didn't buy an island, did you? <laughs> you know, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, that, that, that yeah. Was, but that was the power of it and yeah. people like seeing him joking around and yeah. things like that. Yeah. So... You know, why not be the CEO? Why not have the CEO of a bank, why you know, not? just joking around or just showing a bit more of their personal side or doing a, a Facebook Live, you know, once a year or something like that. Mm. I, it just, I just don't think brands get it yet and I think it will take a while for the Gary V sort of stuff, that mantra to sort of really filter on, on the way up. You think it's because we've got to wait for, because we're in our 30s, so we've got yes. to wait for our generation to get into the positions of decision and control. Probably. Yeah. Probably we, we probably do. And I think companies who embrace it, sooner than later um, will do better yeah. and they'll get that younger market into right. their brand I think a right. lot quicker yeah so do you do content creation outside gyms or just uh, a little bit um, lots, so my guys are freelance videographers um, I do my own sort of stuff um, what's your stuff I haven't seen your channel well, my stuff I don't really I haven't really done it too much but my stuff is sort of I'm still deciding on what sort of everyone says you need a niche so yeah. I don't really have a niche I like a varied things but I'm sort of going into the niche I, um, I had a single mother who's got bipolar yeah. So I grew up in a lot of you know, foster homes and things like that, and there's not a lot of support for young people in that space. So my content's about growing up with a mentally ill parent or you know, post that sort of stuff. So Targeted to those people who are going through the same thing. Yeah, well, young, providing material online for young people or for adults who are still going through the process of you know, all the issues that come with growing up in those environments. So okay. I sort of interview people who you know, do uh, various work in that field. I want yeah. to check it out. Yeah. Do you, so people want to start businesses now, yeah. uh, lost their jobs and so on. And I've interviewed some people talking about how do you start a, how did a guy on who did um, a computer store, how did you drop shipping and so on. Yeah. This is so much more accessible. Get out your phone and start making stuff. Mm. How would you recommend people start and should they start? Should Maybe some people shouldn't. Abs absolutely, you should start and you, won't, you won't, won't believe where you'll be in a year's time. You know, if you go back to our early, really early stuff, you know, ask Jim, you know, started with just me and Jim sitting in front of my computer with a webcam mm. and now it's like a full production when we normally have it back in there. We have a studio and everything for it. You know, we have live audience for it. A live audience? Yeah, every three to four weeks when we have our franchisees come to training, yeah. uh, we do it in front of them. So, you know, you never know where it goes. Mm. Um, a lot of people are scared of what people will say online. You know, just forget about it no matter what you do. You know, you're getting your negativity. Um, so just post. Yeah. And then as you go, uh, you'll get better and better and better and better. But you've got to start. Just people don't start. They want to put too many plans, what my niche mm. is going to be, messages, mm. script, blah, 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 blah. Just, just start, you'll get better as you go, mm. review. And if you just try and concentrate and get a little, you know, 1% better every week or two, mm. um, you know, you'll be, in a year's time, uh, you'll be a lot further. You'll be surprised where you can actually be. Mm. Um, but I think consistency as well is key. Mm. So with with gym script stuff, we're very consistent. We, we pump out a lot of stuff and that's, that's so the Regular main. posting. Absolutely, yeah. regular posting. I think you've got to do it. I don't apply it to my own self, but in yeah. terms of work, yeah. you know, our regularity is pretty spot on. You know, every day we're posting some new video or something like that. But th so this is a cool thing about gyms. A lot of companies, you feel like they're posting every day for the sake of posting every day, and you're like, another ad trying to sell me yeah. something. Yeah. Why don't I get that feel from gyms? Because you are selling. You are selling franchises and so on. Absolutely. And the services. Yeah. Why am I not feeling abused? 
by you guys. I'm glad you don't. Um, I, don't I don't know why, though. I think it's, it's drummed into me that we can't... Like, even our customer newsletter, right? I've been in trouble a few times before. We've, we've done articles which are too... They put the call to action at the start as opposed mm. to the end or they're too, mm. sell, too salesy. Jim doesn't like that. It's all about giving advice and, and mm. showing stories and stuff like that. And that's what we try and do. So with a franchise testimonial, rather than doing a pre-produced, which we still do, mm. let's say four-minute video where we've got only pre-chosen franchisees, mm. I'll do a long-form podcast with a franchisee who approaches me. He wants to talk about the gym system. So, and we'll put that up there. Mm. You know, we won't edit it, nothing like that. It'll just be from start to finish. So, I'm glad you don't think you're getting sold to because that's not the point. But um, well, I know I am being sold to. Well, it's it's not our. It's honestly not. It's probably behind. It's an intention sort of behind it, I guess. But it's we really just want to just show people inside of gyms and what it has done for people. Right. And it's not. And if you want to, you know, go and buy a franchise out of it, then fantastic. Yeah. But it's we just want to have you know show everything that we do, share that our stories. We've got a lot of great people in gyms. You know we've got multi millionaires who run divisions like um, Hader Hussein's from Gyms Cleaning and Sharon Connor from Gyms Dog Wash. So I did a I love founders content as well. I don't know if you know what's that. Founders a entrepreneurial um, YouTube channel, oh. and they do sit down stuff like this. Yeah. So I started doing that with our divisional cool. owners, you know, cool. to build their sort of brand a bit and 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 things like that. Just chatting with someone like that, you can learn yeah. so many things. But it's just trying to, and also a value, you know, how much value can we have? Someone who's started, you know, a business and in 20 years is, you know, multi-millionaire, let's say, paid after the gym's cleaning group. You know, what has that guy done? Why aren't we capturing that? Why aren't we sharing that? Yeah. There's so many of those people out there. And in gyms, we're lucky we've got so many of them. Yeah. Nearly 4,000 franchisees plus franchisors. Yeah. So why not capture as much as we can of that and put it out for, for people uh, to then make a decision about the brand if they're researching us either for their next dog wash or for the next month. That's I really appreciate it because I have I am in no danger of signing up for a franchise. I just I don't <laughs> swing that way. Yeah. Even though a lot of your franchises have been like ex coppers and, and yeah. stuff like that. But I don't swing that but still I, I appreciate that you're putting out content that people like me find valuable. So that's I think that's that real generosity that, that we're talking about. You're making content not necessarily to capture my buy. But you're giving me value nonetheless. Yeah, and that's definitely drummed into us from Jim, you know. Jim's all about giving value, tries to give as much value as he can. You know, and, and that's from me as well. You know, we've got a, we're very lucky. I've got Jim at my disposal to do this sort of stuff. And, you know, he's a very mm. successful, proven multi-millionaire businessman. Mm. Mm. Whereas you have all these fake gurus online trying to upsell you into a oh, masterclass yes, yes. or a mastermind, right? Yeah. So, you know, I'd rather put this stuff out there for free. You know, and you yeah. can learn from Jim. You know, yeah. every week you can learn from Jim, um, as opposed to people having to go down other other channels and things like that. All right. What about attention spans? Because say, ask Jim. Right, yep. is two hours. What? That's hour? an hour every week. Yeah, hour. it's, an hour. it's yeah. long. Yeah, it's a long time. Even this, like, why? Why are you still watching people? <laughs> because it's interesting. Mm. Well, I don't know. You tell me why. What do you think about long form? Well, I, I think long form always going to have a place. Yeah. Um, you know, I think um, it, it's one of those things. It's it's how engagement can, engaging can you make that long form? You know, content. Yeah. Um, I think you're going. It, as you build your audience, you're going to have an audience no matter what who consumes your long-form content. So with us, we have franchisees. We have people doing research on the brand. We have our franchisors. Plus, we have customers as yeah. well. We even jump on. We'll say I've got a customer complaint and things like that. Right. Um, but I think you've got to you've got to try and everyone says make it engaging. Well, how do you make it engaging? Yeah. How do how do we do it? Well, I think with I think with long-form stuff, I, I like live platform for me just right. because you can make it interactive. So of course. You can yeah. let them dictate the conversation if they know they can dictate the conversation. And you know, you say their name, you give them that dopamine hit. They keep, they keep posting things mm. and stuff like that. Mm. I think being Jim as well, having Jim answer their question directly every week mm. for nothing, mm. um, keeps bringing people back. Mm -hmm. um, Ask Jim's probably been one of our best thing as well from franchisee mm. relationships. Mm. So franchisees will feel more comfortable asking a question on Ask Jim most of the time than emailing Jim or calling. Oh, of course, yeah. And it's you know, it's produced some great changes and things like that. And we have people sussing out the brand online and franchisors always trying to win their inquiries and things yeah. like that. And But I think I think just trying to... It might sound really cliche to say it, but just being yourself yeah. in what you do. Yeah. I think people can tell if you're really trying too hard or too scripted these days yeah. um, with long form. But I definitely think long form's got a place. It will always yeah. have a place. And just from a library sort of repository type of thing, you can just keep going back and bang, bang, bang and getting yes. everything you need down the track. So what about in your own life to uh, in terms of long form? Because my consumption has changed radically towards the long form maybe three years ago when I discovered Joe Rogan. Okay. And now I'm 90% I consume long form content. Yeah, well, I'm podcast, I'm podcast yeah, machine podcast. myself. Yeah. You know, podcast back in the early days, um, 
Bill, the ringer I really love in America. The ringer. Yeah, the ringer's a massive sports network. It's a guy called Bill Simmons. Okay. I call him the pod father, but um, oh, yeah. he's basically he sold the Spotify for around a hundred and something million. Oh. He done a similar Rogan deal. Oh. And um, you know, podcast, you know, for me, it's, it's the great way to break out exercise, things like that. So. So you consume a fair bit of long form. I consume a heap of long form. You know, I've started getting into audio books because of the gym. Yeah. But um, for me, I'm still the podcast form, long form. I'll consume a lot of that. I'll have my three or four shows. I don't know about yourself, but. I'll just always three or four, yeah. three or four, yeah. and that's what I'll just listen to all the time. Okay. Yeah. What do you? Where do you see it going long form? Uh, so I mean, you say it's here to stay. It has its place. Yeah, I definitely think it has its place. I think long form will be interesting. It just it'll be interesting to see how brands start using long form content. I don't think enough of them use it. So I know I've been watching a lot about the banks. I thought banks would have been the one doing podcast series and stuff all the time. And I did dabble into it a bit with A and Z was a good example of the business series, but. They sort of went away from it, but um, why? Why do they go away? Yeah, I, I just don't know if they got. It all has to be about ROI for those companies, yeah, right? But again, know? this is a long play, right? This I is agree. brand building. I agree. It's brand building. People will consume it, but they've all got to be on. You know, we've got to spend this money and yeah. directly attribute it to a sale, which I think is the wrong way to go with any sort of content sort of stuff. Okay. But I understand from a business point of view yeah. why you would. Um, long form content. Look, I just think I can only see more people doing it. I can't see it. creating. Yeah, more people creating long form content. Yeah. More people. You know, having niches which are, are more prominent and more people building audiences. I can't see podcasting. I think you know, will still he's still here to stay. Um, you know, it's it's obviously not a hidden thing anymore. It's yeah. it's done by everyone's got seems got their own podcast now. Yes. So, yeah. but I think um, getting productions will get better, st- storytelling will get better, mm. shows will get better, mm. and I think there'll be a lot more money put into podcasting. There's so, obviously. Well, yeah. We, yeah, the Rogan deal and the Simmons deal. Yeah, and Spotify, yeah. But obviously, podcasts, Australia, one in Australia and things like that. You know, people investing into podcasts actually going, well, people, I've got someone's attention for an hour, you know, paying for that attention in that hour from that show, yeah. I think will be uh, will something that will happen a lot more. So how do you monetize, not that you've had to do this with gyms, mm-hmm. right, but how would you monetize, like, I'm not monetized at all. How, how do people start something like this, get some followers and then monetize? Well, I don't think, I think a lot of people who do end up, I've, from what I can tell, people who have a plan to monetize their content from the start never do. What do you mean by that? Well, I sort of think if you come out with a plan and go, I'm going to produce this content and then in a year's time I want to try and sell you into a course that I'm doing or something yeah, like that. Yeah. I just don't think that's, I haven't really seen anywhere online where that's happened. A lot of channels that I think are really successful, uh, it's more of a, I just want to give you value, value, right, value, value, right. value, 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 value. And then if they do happen to develop a product or some coaching or something down the track, yep. um, they put the offer out there and they're generally, they're selling by not selling thing and they den- gen- do, uh, generally do well. I think if your intention is to monetize your content from the start, I think you're in trouble. Sabotages you? I think it does. That's just, that's just my personal opinion. Mm. Um, I think there's, but there's obviously very smart people out there who can probably set up a channel with a framework and then, yeah. and then monetize it. But I just think, you know, personally, me, I wouldn't, that wouldn't be authentic to myself. I think yeah. just putting valuable things out there uh, to start with, and if people like it, then great. If they've got a demand for a product or they ask me to do something, then yeah. I would look at making a product to then monetize it later on. Okay, I agree with you. Yeah. Uh, I certainly, I, well, for me, I found that creating content is hard and to do it regularly, mm. and you give up if you're just trying to make money. So doing it out of passion is, is great. But how, why do you think people, why do you think it sabotages you? Because I have friends who want to start a business selling Alibaba products or sure. whatever. And all they're doing is thinking, how can I profit? How can I quit my job? And they inevitably, like 99%, give up or fail. Well, this is a passion project for you at the moment, right? Yeah, if I put yeah. it back to you. So you know, why do you keep doing it? You know? well, I think we are talking before off yeah. camera, but yeah. it was a really great thing you said. What uh, I, I can't remember what I said. About, about the eulogy. We well, saw a big the, oh, the gap, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought you, it was a really cool... That was from Goggin's book. Well, you, you, you tell, you're you yeah. the guest. Tell me what Goggin says to do about the eulogy. Well, the one book I recommend is David Goggin's Can't Hurt Me. And everyone mm. wants to recommend audiobooks, but this has sort of changed my life. I can relate to him a lot. We have a similar, similar background when we were younger. Um, but basically, you know, when he, he uses the analogy, you know, when he gets to the pearly gates, you know, mm. David Goggins, and he says, you should have been this, but you mm-hmm. but you present as this, mm-hmm. which is not what you could have been. Mm-hmm. You know, and you don't want to be that person. You don't want to leave anything, you know, unturned or not knowing what your true potential potential was, right? So leave anything unturned. So similar to what you said, you know, there's a gap, you know, if people want to be remembered for this or remember for this, and video is great because you can have you can have a legacy. Yes. With, with, with online, with video content so now. Good. You can have a legacy, and that's why with the gym stuff, it's not... I know Jim's getting a bit older and Jim will live for another 30 years, but we've got a great mm. library legacy now. Yeah, We're true. off him. If something 
God forbid, it happen, which it won't, but, yeah. you know, I've got so much stuff. You will know the brand gyms for the next 30 years or 20 so years. True. And uh, with yourself now, what you're creating for yourself, people yeah. will know you, yeah. you know, for 20, 30, you know, a lot longer. So, so did Goggins do that that practical exercise that I told you about? Was that? Yeah, I think it was just a story. I think it was just the story he used. But when he's told me that, I've definitely related to it in what he said. But he's basically, you know, at the end of your life, what's the? Have you? Do you think you've really achieved what you you yeah. could have achieved? Okay. And can you be harsh enough on yourself to ask yourself that question and go, I'm definitely not what I I think I am. And then can you take the actual steps to actually then go and do something about it? Okay. You know, and not many people do. No, it was yeah. hard. Well, I'll tell everyone what I actually did is I wrote two eulogies. So I wrote the eulogy, if I died tomorrow, what would people say? And then I wrote the eulogy of what I would like them to say, and they were radically different. Were they? It's embarrassing. Okay. Yeah, well, I think that'd be for like for most people. But having the, yeah. but that's a great exercise to be able to do it. Do it's it, probably yeah. a sobering thing as well, you think. It is. And then you're like, well, what are this improvement to do? Mm. But in that improvement's the excitement, right? Mm. And then you can go, and then you probably reevaluate what's, pas- what's, what's in your life that's passionate, mm. and then you can mm. maybe focus on that, right? So, because this is obviously a passion mm. project for you, and mm. you know you do some great stuff, and you do a lot of great stuff. Thank you. Um, you know, I do watch a bit of it, and it's um, very impressive. Oh. So, I wish I could actually be probably more like you for my own stuff, but uh, it's something where that exercise, just sitting down, being critical of yourself, and saying, "Have I done, or am I what I can be? Mm. And if not, what are the steps, or what can you do to then change that?" So, that's going to be a little grab right there. What you just said, I'll put that out. Okay, cool. Short. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> do you like lamb? Lamb? Yeah. Yeah. Do you eat meat? I do, yeah. Oh, I've got a lamb on the spit roast outside. I don't know how busy you are, but you're welcome to eat it with me. Absolutely. It'd be great. Thank you. I thought I'd bring up the lamb to help you relax. Yeah. No, you seem relaxed, but earlier you said, you know. Yeah, I'm a bit nervous. It's a bit tight in the chest, so I feel... <laughs> I know what our franchisees and our franchisors uh, feel now when I interview them, because I do, I do a lot of Zoom interviews now, and they go, oh, a bit, they're a bit nervous. I'm sort of like, oh, don't worry. Oh, it'll be easy, be easy. So... What should we do? Yeah. Do you reckon we... I don't know how Rogan does it. Just ch- talk for... Well, he gets them drunk. They take... Dr- they smoke and they drink. I don't really want to do that. <laughs> so I, I do drink, but, um, yeah. I, could, I guess I could <laughs> ply you with alcohol before we start. Thank you. Uh, yeah okay content creation oh it's such a such a joy for me and uh i like that what you're saying about having a legacy to leave behind because some people have noticed talking to um gary v says this is how you do it they get they start trying to make money or quit their jobs but then three months six months later they say oh forget that like i'm just having such good fun my kids have a, a memory of me forever and i think really what we're doing is we're talking about building brand for the individual, right? Yeah, absolutely. We haven't really, as a society, thought about brands that way, except for maybe Justin Bieber and whatever. And so brands have always been about A and Z or what have you. Mm. And so I'm very interested in this, um, this, this thing that's happening where we're making brands out of ourselves. Well, people are making million dollar livings of being personal branding coaches, right? Really? Yeah, absolutely. There's a, there's a lady called Ruby Lee. All she does is okay. coach people on their per- personal brand to be their authentic self. I think so. LinkedIn tagline. You'll see personal branding coaches all over LinkedIn. It's uh, it's becoming a big business. PR for individuals. PR for individuals, basically. And I, and I think, you know, it's very contrived. You know, you got to have a really great headshot and then you meet that person in real life. I look nothing like their headshot. Yeah. Or it's really well, well, a lot of contrived stuff. But I think everyone is a brand. You are a brand. Every person, no matter if you like it or not, if you don't think of it that way, Everyone's got values and, and you know, yeah. what you can project on the wild is how you present yourself, things like that. Well, even before social, right, we're yeah. a brand. Like, you'd be known amongst your friends a particular way. Absolutely. That's absolutely. Your brand. Well, it's a great point, Matthew, and I never really... Oh, that's true. You did know? you just call me Matthew? I did. I feel like I'm in trouble. No, well, oh, I don't know what they're called. Well, you're putting your email to Matthew, so I'm going to call you by a name. No, so. I don't but care. Matt, I don't Matt, care. You go by Matt? I don't care. You go by Matt? Yes. Okay. But um, I think, yeah, you're right. You know, what would your friend say? Oh, your friend would, would probably describe you in three or four words, right? Yeah. And is that what you really want to be aligned with, right? Mm. So your behaviours also have to reflect what you want to be known for. So mm. you, know, you don't want to be one thing behind closed doors and like this the other way. So mm. that's why it's good working with Jim so much is because the way he is behind closed doors is exactly the way he presents on camera. Mm. It's, it's pretty much the same thing. And, and with the whole um, you know, recent lockdown with him doing all the big, the big media outlets like Seven and, mm. and things like that, it's exactly who he is. And he's um, sticking by his mantra, which is the franchisees first. So, mm. yeah. You, you, you're pretty cheeky with him, I've noticed. In the I am. Content. I'm probably, I think that's why a lot of the franchisors like it. Yeah, um, I like it. Like, I'm probably, I get away with it a little bit. Um, yeah. yeah, I think I think it's good. You know, you've got to have that banter on, you know, especially in podcasts and things like yeah. that. It's, you can't, if it's a serious topic, then fair enough. But I think uh, 
Yeah, I've, that's why I miss the office because in the office he we we definitely banter a lot more than via Zoom. You know he. Of course. Yeah. He likes because we sit next to each other. Yeah, I love yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah, so we can definitely get back in there and um, hopefully soon and and do it. But um, he likes to give me crap about my weight and all this sort of thing and. He'll go. He'll he'll go after the show. He'll generally go to me. Oh, you know, you didn't give me enough back tonight, or you didn't say this to me. You should call me this. You should say this. Oh, to he's me. he's asking for he, ribbing. He's, absolutely, he's giving me material. So I'm like, you're my boss. You know, I can't go too hard. So Legend. it's sort of a bit of a balance. But um, you know, he goes, oh, call me skeleton or call me skeletor. Or I liked it when you call me weak, weak old man or something like that. And does he, yeah. be, he does he insult you about your weight? He says, call me skeleton. And I'll call you fat or something. Yeah, no, he just I just you know he, he looked down. He'll try and what can I give him grief about? And he'll pick on that or whatever it is, and then. I used to weigh 145 kilos. Really? Yeah. Okay. I don't know if you want to talk about weight weight or not. Thanks. I'm working on it. No, I couldn't couldn't tell. Uh, Is weight... Do you, should we, can we talk no, about No, I'm weight? fine about weight. Yeah, no. So, uh, have you... Did, I grew up fat. Did you grow up fat? I grew up really skinny. You grew so, up really skinny? Yeah, I grew up really skinny. So, I um, hit the gym really hard and... Yeah. You look average average, average man in Australia. Yeah. You don't look yeah. fat. No, but. no, but that's what Jim just says because I'm fat compared to him. Oh, he's, only, okay. you know, he's only a regular man. He's only 60 kilos. or He's all skin and bones, so... What's it like to grow up skinny? Yeah. I've never been skinny. What's it like to grow up skinny? Uh, you play a lot of sport, a lot of energy, but um, it all goes as you get a bit older, as you know. Um, well, I've gone the other way. Yeah, well, I, well, if you told me you're 145 before, I wouldn't believe you. So. So, what, okay, so if you, someone grows up... This is, what I, this is what I'm thinking, right? If yeah. someone grows up fat, like I did, they learn social coping skills beyond looks. Especially, let's say if a really, really good-looking girl, they would learn from a young age to rely on their looks or bat their eyelids just in small micro, micro encounters with people at the coffee shop or whatever to get favor when you're being served at a bar or whatever absolutely rules of life don't apply to good looking women that's right absolutely and and men as well mm. now i didn't have that so i had to develop a bit of humor and i had to become a nice person yeah and then now hopefully i can start to look better and, and i'll be a great package mm. and i'm already married but whatever <laughs> but what it, yeah but whereas people who grew up good looking i find like um later in life often there's a lack if they're really good looking there's a lack of personality there absolutely they do struggle and, and they're boring people you I know? feel sorry uh, for them absolutely that's very very true I know, I know a couple of people like that and then um, yeah it's like well, well what else you got you know? and, that's <laughs> yeah. what, and that's what happens you know you may be hot but what else you got so uh, definitely one of those things what do you what do you do if you my daughters are really good looking because so my wife's Swedish I'm half Asian half New Zealand <laughs> so my daughter's yeah. going to be too good looking it's my problem well, I just don't think make any exceptions. You know, rules of life apply to. Don't her. let them get away. Don't let them get away with anything. That's what I would say. What do you think about children and content? Good question. Um, obviously, YouTube has the the thing: is this content made for children or not? Yeah, yeah no, um, but the, the children cre- being being made content famous. Creators. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, I think it's an interesting one. Um, obviously, you know, I don't think a lot of the parents start out that way because they're big business. That that young kid who does all the toys on on YouTube, earning millions of dollars, earning millions of dollars. You know. I, the thing is, I don't think they started out, you know, with their intention to do that at all. It's just sort of morphed into that. But um, I think I'd have a problem if, if, you know, the parents trying to monetize their kid yeah. by doing so. Absolutely, I think that would be wrong. But um, I think it'd be great. It's good fun. You know, kids consume a lot of content now. They're addicted to their iPads and their phones. Yeah. Um, you know, why not have something where they're actually making the content as opposed to consuming it? So film them and put them out. Was, it's it's yeah. a dangerous world out there, though. It is. It is. You'd have to be comfortable with that as a parent, I presume. I'm not a parent, so I would not know. Um, but uh, you have to be comfortable with it, and you would obviously want to be. You, up, yeah. you married? No, definitely not. No, no I'm definitely not. Joel's available. <laughs> no, I've got a girlfriend. So, oh, okay. yeah, I've got a girlfriend. Yeah, no, yeah, you'd have to be careful with that. But I, I've thought about that because it's a whole new world they're growing up in. Like Gary Vee is going to be old school by the time they're yeah. our twenties. Well, it's, I agree. It's going to be scary. What comes next? Like, what could you? Th- like, I'm ask you. What, what could you see beyond? What yeah. from our childhood into well, this yeah. social, yeah. and then now? What? Yeah, I just don't know. Is it is it virtual reality things? Is it AR stuff? I don't. I don't really know. Well, they're the technolo- technologies, right? But the technology is just the this, this, the things we stand on. Yeah. It's the culture that changes. True. Well, I yeah. think I think there's a lot of people are becoming more open online, more freer, right? Whereas they'll yeah. they'll tell people stuff about themselves. They're probably more comfortable doing it on video, yeah, or on their vlog as opposed to actually talking to. Their parents are talking to their friends about things. Oh, know? yeah, like about weight and stuff. We did, yeah, yeah, yeah. Stuff. You know, yeah, people, that's pe- true. Yeah, and I just think it's almost, I think content creation can almost be a bit of therapy in a way. It is. Um, yeah. You know, especially with my, my podcast I did, I talked to a, a girl we had a similar experience growing up, and yeah. she works with a charity in, in Melbourne, and it was just like good meeting someone you could actually talk to yeah. on, rec- on record about certain things, and it was very therapeutic. So yeah. I think from a content creation point of view, I think. Um, 
it being used as a therapy. I don't know. Maybe that's something moving forward. But I'll be, I'll be scary to see what happens in the next 10, 10 to 15 years because you're right. The Gary V sort of stuff that we really like, mm. uh, you know, will be outdated. So what will replace it? I don't know. But no idea. He thinks we're all going to live to 100, so he'll be here telling us some stuff. <laughs> as an old man, he'll still be going off the walking stick and, yeah, yeah true. But, uh, well, his theory is that uh, everything's going to be uh, broken down into brand. Okay. As in commoditization, mm-hmm. right? Of, of goods and services is happening all over the world, Amazon, China, blah, blah, blah. The only way to stand out, same with services, like you're a real estate agent. How do you stand out from the other real estate agents? You, you brand and you make videos on what it's like to sell a house, what it's like to set up for an auction. Mm. So that's his theory. Everyone goes to brand and the first ones who get there win. Mm. I agree. And the voice is obviously big in voice search and things like that as well. So having that brand signal. How do we, how do we, how do we leverage voice? Uh, it's a good question. I've something I've started trying to raise with our franchisors. I actually had a voice, a voice uh, mowing app made. So you actually go, you know, call, G- hey, Jim's mowing, and start doing the lawn mower and say, this is Jim's mowing. What can we do for you? So and then st- what happens then, though? After- uh, and then basically it says, oh, what can we do for you today? You know, and then it yeah. lists the range of services. Would you like to? Would you like to request a quote? What do you need done? Oh, so it's a website basically. Yeah, yeah, it scans the website and then basically they submit it to uh to the Google Google uh, developers. Yeah. And then, um, yeah, it gives them a lot, bunch of options and things like that. And yeah. then uh, that's the next thing. I think a lot of voice SEO is a, is a big thing. Okay. Um, and then you can actually have it when you have, let's say, if you had a device in your home, you could say, hey, Google, show me how to get a, a good edge on my lawn. And you'd hopefully they'd pull up, you know, this is how you do it, and pull up the video from Jim's mailing with the guy doing the edge, that sort of stuff. Well, it's you a know. funny thing because I, I'm so into Jim's brand now. Mm. Uh, if I was to want to look up lawn mowing, stuff i used to go on youtube and write yep. how to edge a lawn i wouldn't do that now i would okay. i would go to jim's mowing and i would search edging because i've seen you guys talk about how you got to flip the whip snipper over upside yeah. down and all this kind of stuff. very controversial topic how to use a whip <laughs> snipper oh i tell you well, we got so much heat when we did that yeah like all because there's around 1900 mowing franchises right and everyone's yeah, yeah, yeah. everyone's they're all experts in the great what they do there's all different techniques you got to hold it by the head or yeah. why is he walking backwards you should be walking forward should be on the other side so very controversial those videos are yeah but um yeah we we have obviously they you know we have on youtube facebook instagram those sort of things and they live on the website as well but yeah. i think yeah i think people the the old comment i used to get why would we want to show someone how to edge their lawn it's so helpful uh, exactly but it's it, a, it's a, a lot of people who watch that stuff don't actually do it no you know? well i do but yeah yeah, yeah well I mean, you, that's fantastic but a lot of people just watch it they're just interested in it you it's know? amazing they just like seeing it being done and then you know, they will then, okay, I'll think of Jim's next time. They need their lawn mode because I've seen a guy show me how to use an edger. So this is what I find interesting though is the way I search for the information is I would actually say to Alexa in 10 years from now, what does, show me Jim's how to, how yeah. does Jim edge? I wouldn't, you know, it's specific about the brand. And I'm hoping that's what happens here. People like, uh, what does discernible say about the emergency bill? Yeah, and that's exactly right. And that's how, you know, that's how I think it's going to be categorize content and then you know provide that result to someone mm. how they do it if it's whether it's a you know, say bring up something that brings it up on a screen or mm. it, it reads it back out to you um you know having that content there that's why i think the important stuff doing a lot of video now i think doing this video now i think as it gets more advanced you know don't get me wrong and, and put anything in the comments about search engines but they'll start I always say they say they scan video i know they say they crawl the video and yeah. stuff like that to see what, what it's about transcript yeah things like that but i don't think it's what they say so I think by having this stuff now, you know, I think eventually... Uh, well, they will be able to crawl it later. Yeah, yeah. and that's what I'm thinking, you know, and that's the way I look at it. So all the stuff we're putting out now will just be yeah. get crawled a lot better as we go and then we'll be more relevant and more brand into those very relevant search engines. So what do you think would be the be- the, the safest way to prepare for that would be to video, just put out heaps of video and mm-hmm. then you cover it because that covers your audio, covers your brand. Yeah, I, I personally think video. You know, I think video, much much long form video content as you can. You can obviously yes. get that Gary V content deck on how to repurpose it. Yeah. And pillar you can re- content model, yeah. Pillar content model, just just repurpose it and think what you've got is actually people are interested in it. No matter what you do, right. someone is interested in in what you do. No matter what it is, right? Could be installing smoke alarms, could be, you know, um, mowing a lawn, whatever it is. People are interested yes. in what you do, so don't think you're not interesting. Everyone is interesting. Everyone's got something to say. And I think that's what people get hung up on is like, I'm not that interesting or whatever. Absolutely, everyone is interesting. And when I'm on the other other side of this, when I interview our franchisees and franchisors, I enjoy finding out about every other person. You find out so many things about everyone. So just, just, just know that you've got, everyone's got something valuable to offer the world no matter what it is. So you are often in this chair having an interesting time with other people. You must have learned a lot. 
I have. I've learned that I should buy a franchise and I haven't yet. So <laughs> <laughs> I think that's probably more because I'm loyal to probably gyms and I, I like what I do. Yeah. You know, I really do like what I do. Um, but yeah, it's I probably learnt, um, you know, don't thumb your nose at the service industry. And that's that's another thing I didn't say at the start. Like, what, what do you mean? I think a lot of people, they get sold the narrative, you know, in school, you've got to go to uni. If you don't go to uni, you, uh, you know, you're going to be... Low, low level. Low level whatsoever. Mowing lawns. Whatsoever. Mowing lawns, you know, cleaning business, dog wash, whatever it is, right? You've got million, millionaires mowing Correct. lawns. And this is the thing. I don't think people realise the actual potential of the home services interest, industry. Yeah. They don't understand the potential. In it. And I see it all the time. You've got people who, if they went through the typical system, they might be on 65, 60K a year, mm. mid-40s, mm. you know, unhappy, a lot of debt. Whereas they can go and have a mowing and garden care franchise and six figures, which they, which they would, and be a lot happier, fitter, healthier. You know, people just thumb their nose at this service industry, and I don't know why. It's because of the, um, you know, maybe it's probably a lot of the content online saying, you know, oh, it's easy to just do a startup, get some venture capital, get some seed funding. Yeah, you the know? sexy stuff. Sexy stuff, right? Whereas the sex, the not sexy stuff is actually making you a lot higher chance of success, and it's something that's, that's and you're going to make a good income doing it. How common is it for them to earn over 100k in like? What well, it- we presume most franchisees are turning over at least 100k, or wouldn't be worth it with franchise fees and things like that so okay. our presumption is that most franchisees make 100k I did an interview with a franchisee called Dan Cahill 26 and he turned over 480 grand in his second year yeah. he's a mowing garden care franchisee yeah and then minus all of his staff minus his staff so minus his on, fees and stuff yeah but, but is he on, do you reckon he's on 50k or is oh, he on, I'd be netting uh, he'd be netting probably maybe 180 okay one, one so very, very good life yeah. very good life you know. and it's a 26 year old and this is a guy who was oh, a manager wow. at Macca's Oh, right. Wow. So the kids who's going down the, the let's say the doctor or the law law sort of path, yeah. you know, he'll be earning more money than those people at the same age, well, most likely. We both did law, hated we did. it. We did, did nothing with it. True, I did nothing with it at all. I literally I did it for my mum and so so my mum's got my degree in. Yeah. And um She's got your degree. I, yeah, I gave it to my mum, you know. <laughs> we have I just gave it to her. She's in a nursing home at the moment, unfortunately, oh, so okay. I had to put her in one yeah. but um you know, she's she's got my degree, I did it for her and right. I'm happy I did it, but um yeah. she wanted me to do it, but I, it was the most useless and expensive. Fifty grand I've ever spent. So. Fifty grand. Yeah, I think mine was like ninety. I oh, did. A, I did a double. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Ninety sure. grand for a double. I think it was. I can't. I, I, maybe Machine I was that? years ago. UTS in Sydney. UTS. Okay. Yeah. It's a lot of money for a double degree. Yeah, I can't recall. Yeah, but but I never use it. But um, you know, I think that's that. I saw that narrative. You know, you do law, you do you know medicine, you'll be successful. Whereas yeah. I'm learning from all our franchisees that's not the case, and you yes. should do something what you like to do and. I just like talking to me, get a lot of energy from talking to franchisees. Yeah. I like going out on the road and seeing their operations and you know, they're they're doing you know, they're doing great things for themselves and their families and you know, it's it's not BS. If you want to find out about gyms, you just watch those podcasts or the interviews with our franchisees. They're not yeah. contrived. I don't send them any questions before. Yeah. It's not edited, it's just that's it. Um, yeah, and they'll they tell you how much they're making and, and how much happier they are. You know it's funny, I watch those day in the life of whatever Jim's fencing guy. Oh yeah, Justin, yeah. Oh, is that what it was? Yeah, Justin Trainer. Yeah, he's a good guy. Or a mowing guy. And then, and then I'm I'm watching and thinking, oh, he's a good salt of the earth, uh, yeah. tradey type guy. And then I find out, no, he used to be the head of finance at some bank or something. Correct. Corporate finance, yeah. What? Yeah. The... And what? the other guy's an ex-police officer. I'm like, what is going on? Yeah, Matt, Matt Thorpe was the ex-police officer. Yeah, the day in life. So we can do a lot more of them. I love them because they're our yeah. best for me. You know, if you're not a bad Jim's franchise, just watch that. But yeah. um, yeah, we have a lot of people from so many backgrounds, high management positions, corporate yeah. guys and... The good thing about them is they, they have those business fundamentals down and they can yes. scale their business operation really quickly. So yeah. within a year or two, they might have two to three trailers on the road and they've replaced their income at their previous job yeah. with doing the mowing and garden care franchise, for example, or, or fencing with Justin. He might work three to four days a week and mm. earn a similar amount of money. You know, But people thumb their nose up at doing manual tasks for whatever reason. And you know, my, A lot of my families are dairy farmers and stuff like that. So for me, it's definitely not the case. But... um. I think there's just that if there's no sexiness to that home services or no. industry, and that's sort of doing this sort of content trying to show people, hey, if you want actually a better chance of earning a six-figure in- income, you're better off statistically probably doing this yes. as opposed to doing this, and you'll be a lot happier doing it as well. It's hard to get past the suits and stuff. They're like, you know, I'll go to law school and I'll, I'll look like this, mm. or I see your guys. Um, wearing the gym shirt in fluoro and you just don't associate yeah. that they're earning more than the guy in the suit. I don't know if Jim mentioned it, but there's a book, The Millionaire Next Door. Yeah, it's yeah, a great he, book. he would have mentioned it, yeah? yeah? Have you read it as well? Oh, I've read it from a, as a kid, yeah, yeah, years ago. But yeah. He didn't mention it, yeah. You know, but the home services industry is probably, you know, that's your chance if you want to make, you know, you can be a millionaire in the home services industry and you've got a higher chance probably doing that. Why, why is that growing as a market demand? People just don't want to do that. People just don't want to do it. People don't have the skills to do it. Um, 
But we're losing the skills because. Maybe, yeah, I don't know if we're losing the skills, but um, you know, we, we're pretty lucky. We can we can train someone up pretty pretty well in doing it. Yeah. Um, but I just think a lot of people just don't want to do the work. They just that doesn't have that image, as you said before, of that suit and stuff yeah. like that. That just doesn't have that image. Whereas they might be rocking up with their their boots on and their high vis and yeah. some stubby shorts on. And a picture of Jim here. It's and not that cool, him. really. Being called Jim. Well, we're trying to make it a bit more cooler. So I think maybe Jim's black like Jim's t-shirt, but we uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, we'll keep the the brand's going to stay the same. <laughs> we we've tried, we've had a few people a few times want to you know make it change the branding and stuff, but I think that logo will be iconic. And you can't change it. Can't ever. change. We got Jim's uh, Monopoly now. We can't change it. So what? Yeah, yeah Monopoly Jim's, game. We do. Yeah. So Jim basically, <laughs> Jim basically goes to me one day. We want to. Someone on asked Jim said, "Oh, we should have Jim's Monopoly." Then Jim after the show goes, "Oh, we should um do Monopoly. Can you make it happen?" How do you do that? Can I? Can anyone get their own Monopoly set? You can, yeah. Oh, where do, where do we do it? It's called Winning Moves. Winning Moves is a company in Sydney. Um, right. They'll arrange it with you as well. Uh, you have to do a 1,500 uh, minimum order quantity, but oh, okay. you can Never have mind. your own Monopoly for whatever you want. <laughs> oh, okay. It's, right. uh, it was a bit of money, but um, yeah, but we got it done and we've got a gym script Monopoly now and we yeah. can start posting them out again, which is great, from the office. and. Okay. We've got a game. We, me and Jim played a game with our two content boys and yeah, yeah it's good fun. Okay. Yeah. It sounds like everyone loves being at gyms. I mean, we need to stop talking about gyms. It's a giant gym <laughs> ad, but True. I guess that's what you do. You seem to really love it. I do. Well, that's why I'm still there. That's why I haven't bought a franchise yet. But um, yeah. I do. Look, it's a tough place to work. I don't know how much people got that from Jim, but Jim's a very... He's a brilliant man. He's got a lot of ideas, but it's a very, very tough place to work. Everything's very lean. Yeah. You know? it's, it's, you've got to do things yourself. You can't be a delegator oh, really? at head office, but it's, um, it's a good environment. You know, I'm very lucky. Yeah. What are your plans moving forward? Uh, you know, keep keep building our content, keep getting better. Um, hopefully, you know, stay there for as long as I can. I, I like working with gyms. Oh, you, you want know? to stay at gyms? Ab- absolutely. You know, I, I like working there. I think I can do... Like 10 more years? Yeah, more, you know, depending on how long you'll have me and sure. put up with me annoying him. But, um, okay. you know, we see a lot of each other probably too much when we do all these videos and things. But, uh, yeah, I, I love working there. I love what we do. You know, we it generally does help people. I know this sounds like an advertisement, but um, yeah. I enjoy, enjoy the job and it gives me a lot of trust and... Learning new skills, like all the videos and stuff, I would never have thought two or three years ago I'd be doing, you know, being asked to do an interview on, on the content I do, yeah. for example. It's not something yeah. I would have imagined, and it's thanks to uh, Jim's and our franchise, Alls and Z's, who allow us to do it. Don't you get tempted by the success of I mean, because if you work for someone, you're capped at, you are, you know, highest level pay, 180K or something. Mm. You don't really get above 150. If you, yeah. If you want to earn 300, 400, mm. you're going to have to leave. Well, that's true. You know, maybe one day that might be that might be the case to do it. Um, but I think still you know, gather as much knowledge as I can, keep learning, and and build a lot of networking and stuff as well. You know, I've met a lot of great people for gyms who I would call friends outside of this, yeah. um, post this. But um, yeah, you're right. That might be the decision. But what vehicle will I choose to make that three hundred and four hundred grand? It's something I still haven't decided. You know, what's my passion? You know, it's something I don't want to. I've always said if I'm going to do a business or a company, it's got to be something I'm passionate about. Yes. I'm not even going to bother. So you know, I have still haven't found that. Um, I'm passionate about what I actually do my job. So, yeah. um, Jim's probably lucky in that regard. I'm actually really passionate about what I do. Yeah. Um, I don't, don't have really have a passion where I think I can give it a full crack to monetize yet. I haven't found it at the moment. So, but then I guess the question is, do you, do people even need or want that kind of money? Sometimes yeah. I wonder if we chase it and we. Well, what's the point? Well, you've been obviously very very successful yourself. You know, did it when you did that analysis? Was it did it even come into the when you were doing it? Oh, when I was depressed. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and I just did this out of passion, yeah. Yeah, yeah but I, I, I sit across from people earning anywhere from zero to mm. um, gym. I don't know what he earns, millions. And everyone has a different sort of priority structure. And I'm noticing that the common thread amongst all, all of them, though, is that money is not the should not be the thing you chase. No, it's, it's definitely it's, a byproduct. It's, yeah. it's, it's an empty goal. It is. It's an empty goal. It's a byproduct. Um, you know, you've got to try and find a purpose. I'm still probably trying to find my purpose myself. You know, I haven't probably found it yet. Um, but I think if you have a purpose or a passion, you'll be happy earning no matter what. If it's forty grand, a hundred grand, whatever, as long as you've, as long as you've got something you're you're really passionate or purpose, you know, you think that gives you purpose and fulfilment. I think money will follow, or money might even be relevant to what you're doing, as long as you're doing something you really do, really like. Can we talk about you, your journey trying to find purpose? Because you have a keen understanding of like Gary Vee, mm. David Goggins, and therefore I think all the other greats that we can name. Yeah which are very much self-aware type people mm. encouraging you to find your... How are you going with it? It's hard. It's very hard. You know, my, my sister, my younger sister tends to lecture me a bit about it, and um, but it's very hard. You know, I come from a different background than most. You know, we pretty had much, uh, 
premature traumatic childhood. Um, oh, yeah. because of your mum? Yeah, I had a single mum with bipolar, and yeah. her bipolar was really bad, you know, yeah. always in and out psychiatric wards and stuff. And yeah. so you have an old man around the, um, you know, you always be in foster homes or friends' families, and you're trying yes. to. And back in the day, it was very stigmatized still. Yeah, yeah. So you would never talk about it. There was no support services for kids. So wow. you basically just, you know, mum's in the psychiatric ward, and you'd be at a friend's house the next day, you know, and then. So your work must feel very unstable. Yeah, yeah, and that's why I probably like being at gym so long because it's a stable environment oh. for me, and that's why I like probably working for someone. So trying to get out of my comfort zone a bit and have that instability or trying to challenge yeah. myself is something I probably need to work on. Um, probably just trying to find what I'm purpose about. So I've started doing dabbling a bit into my own podcast, which yeah. is about mental health. What's, um, what's it called? So people can look it's called it. Authentic Convos with Joel Cleaver. I don't know if that's going to be the name. I'm just sort of dabbled in it. I haven't been consistent at all. You can find it on Google, Spotify. Google, Spotify, yeah. yep. Um, but it's more, you know, trying to create stuff that I would find useful if I was a young person again. Mm. So, you know, if I was a young kid again, there was no resources, there was no mm. no counselling, no nothing for this, you know. Um, and there still probably isn't. There's probably one organisation that I know of called Satellite who actually help young kids who have parents in those situations mm. with resources and workshops and things like that. So mm. trying to... It's hard. I've listened to a lot of content probably like yourself and... Yep. But when you're actually trying to apply it to yourself and be real for yourself, I just find it really hard. Have um, you, you do much Jordan Peterson? I love Jordan Peterson. Yeah. You've done his authoring suite? No, I haven't. No. It's cheap online. It's like right. 30 bucks or something. Okay. Like, yeah. And you, you, you self authoring suite where you write out. Anyway, have a look at that. And you've done it? Yeah. I've done the first part. Okay. This is the second part as well. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I've only done like 20%. All right, I'll take a note of that because, um, yeah, definitely, definitely, it's all well and good, you know, doing these things and, and listening to this content, but apply it to yourself and really apply it to yourself. Can yeah. you do it? I don't think a lot of people do. Um, we like to sort of go wishy-washy and yeah I've listened to this and I've really absorbed it but yeah. try and actually sit down and apply it so um, probably haven't done that yet I do know I love doing video content I love yeah. I love talking to people I yeah. love um, I love doing things hosting things and stuff like that but yeah. whether that's in a paid capacity or whether it's probably doing something like yourself in regards to content that I would want to put out there or like mm. um, yeah it's another story it's probably take me a bit more longer on that journey to get there with you, with you growing up, can, this is a bit off topic, sure. but I'm fascinated by the brokenness in my childhood, which I think sounds a little bit less broken than yours, mm. but still I find myself reacting yeah. because of the way I grew up. And I was thinking about the way you, you grew up. D does that sense of insecurity affect you as an adult? Absolutely it does. You know, probably you probably become less risk, risk you know, I yeah. don't take as many risks. You know, that's probably why I've worked at gyms for so long. I love working there, but it's probably yeah. why I haven't sort of gone... I'm probably at an age now where I can sort of go and I've got enough skills and yeah. I can do something else, but you just it just sort yeah. of pulls you back. And I think, yeah. and that's why, you know, the content I've done is I posted a lot online, my own personal Facebook, and I don't have, that's yeah. pretty private, but I had a lot of messages from people saying, I went through the same thing, I went through the same thing. Yeah. And you're right, your childhood definitely does, it shouldn't define you, but it, it and everyone says it shouldn't define you, let go of the past and all that sort of stuff, but it's a lot easier said than done. That. Nah, yeah. in those formative years, you've got those, events happen or those tra those traumatic events happen to you, it takes a really special person to really fully deal with those and not yes. have them affect them. It's always going to shape who you are. And, yes. and to be honest with you, I don't, you know, you can't change and I wouldn't probably change it, you know, if I could because it's made me who I am today. Yeah, why would you? Yeah, why would you? You know, I think I'm happy with myself and, and yeah. things like that. Um, but I definitely think, you know, you've got to constantly uh, keep working on yourself and things like that. I, I didn't do counselling until I was probably 28. You know, just... You did I've never done counselling. Yeah. Is it good? Uh, it was okay for me, more just, just talking at an anonymous sort of level with someone, just getting things yeah. out. Okay. Um, but, you know, I sh you know, as a growing up in the environment I did, I, that you think I would have done that, but I was way more adverse to psychologists than that, right. just based on my experiences with them uh, when I was younger. So, oh, because back then, when you were younger, they were removing you and yeah, drilling exactly. you. Yeah, and... exactly. Spot on, spot on. So, yeah, they were basically the ones, you know, taking the old girl away and, yeah. and things like that or, you know, putting too much medication or giving the ECT and things like that. So. Okay. That's why I always distance myself from that, and yeah. those, you know, and that does really does affect you as you go a bit older. I'm a bit more mature now, but um, you definitely do a bit more riskier things in your youth and yeah. and things like that. And I think the other thing that comes from it is the victim mentality. You know, we all have. Did this, you have that? Absolutely. You know, and people know me. Uh, you know, probably when I was 24, 25, said, you know, we didn't like you from this age to this age. Oh. Yeah, pretty much because of that victim mentality, that victim mindset, and it was basically took sort of an intervention from my family or from my uncles to sort of not invite me to any sporting events when they take all my cousins and things like that to really sink it through. How and would that, that manifest for you, being the victim? It was, how did it manifest? Yeah, how did you... Well, well, I think when you're younger, you know, you think, you know, when you... I've paid all, had all this hard life, yeah. you know, you think things are just going to be given to you or it's going to happen and 
you know, you have a lot of resentment for things at the time yep. and you think it's just going to go away and all things are going to happen for you. That's not how the world right. will treat you. They only know you who for you are. They don't know your story. They don't know your background. So, you know, they've got to, they can only treat you as you come to them. Yep. So you don't wear your, you know, your life story in your sleeve. Yep. So uh, once I got over that, I actually started being you know, someone I'd like to be around and things like that. Uh, things started happening for me. Yep. You know, work went better relationships with family went better once I just sort of put that aside and said look that's crap that's happened or that circumstance has happened to you you know let's move on and that's why I love this book Can't Hurt Me by David Goggins so much because similar story similar story but he had more physical abuse so oh, right. you know from his from his dad right. but um you know and he he always used that as his excuse all the time and then just basically one day snapped out of it and went bang and that's sort of the same thing with me you know I think just you have all these things and just one moment this moment of clarity where you go nah it's on me to change and to be who I want to be and you just do it and then yeah it's just it just just takes time for some people um but yeah it just happens yeah well uh, hopefully it's encouraging to let you know that i i barely you know, i've just met you mm. watching you in the past month or two and you definitely don't come across as a victim so you've clearly kicked it well i hope so i hope so it took it took a lot of it took a lot to do that um you know and that's you know it's, i appreciate that but um yeah it definitely took a lot to work on but i think a lot of people you know, some small scales or not, you know, and will play the victim, whether it be in business even for themselves, you know, oh, I blame this person, I blame this person, I blame this person. Where you are in life is truly a result of your actions and your decisions up until then. You know, no matter what, there might be some circumstances which are a bit different, but, you know, how you control your attitude, how you present to people is something you can control, um, regardless of what's happened in the past, I think. Yeah. What do you think of the uh, victim mindset coming out of government, political leaders <laughs> and business right now? Yeah, well, it's an interesting one, obviously, with Jim being such at a forefront with it. And, um, you know, I've watched you a lot more well-adverse and, and smart, a lot more intelligent on these subjects than what I am. Um, but I think I think you just got to adapt. You know, I think businesses, it might sound really harsh to say this, but... Um, go harsh. Go harsh. It might be the kick in the ass that some businesses needed to adapt to online things, for example. It's forced a lot of their hands to go online. Obviously, e-commerce is booming now. Yep. E-commerce, in my opinion, should have been booming before this lockdown. Yes. I don't know why. It's just so much more easy. But and, and remote working and all of that. Yeah. yeah. I like retail shops. There's no need for a retail clothing shop now, You know, in my opinion. Really? I, this is what how I dare you? I know. How dare I say that? But... I love Lululemon. Okay, really? There's just yeah. some stores that make a good experience. Yeah. Well, I'm sure there's... I think a store having an experience in a store is another thing. Yes. I think having it where you solely sell, sell your things is gone. I think yeah. if you actually have... Yeah, right, brand, a brand store or an experience store. Yeah, yeah. Like, this is our brand's experience in this store. Yeah. And that, but you purchase your things online yeah. is where everything needs to go. Yeah. And unfortunately, a lot of these little retailers now have to go online or they have to go to business or do something else. So, yeah. I think it's sort of forced a lot of people to really reevaluate as well what they want to do in life. So, I'm thinking... A lot of small businesses and stuff, and it's time if they fail, that person can now really look at themselves and go, what do I want to do? Or really have some really good self-analysis. It's yes. very tough on, yes. on people, I can understand. But uh, yeah. I think it's definitely forced a lot of people to look at themselves. Have you yeah. seen the meme, uh, the, who led the digital transformation at your business? A, B, or C? <laughs> it's um, the CFO, you know, the CEO, <laughs> or COVID-19. COVID-19, <laughs> yeah, I've seen that one. It's very true. You know, it's extremely true. Yeah. Um, but, you know, we're going to have a lot of... There's going to be some couple of big tech giants that emerge from this mm. and start up all during this time. And, mm. you know, they'll go, this is because of this. So there'll be a lot more positives out of it. But the victim mindset, I understand everyone's got a right to feel to feel that way. But you can't... You only feel sorry for yourself so long and it will only get you so far. So I just take stock at this this time, you know, maybe use that free time to, to upskill, to actually get to the core of what you you are and then see if you can make a career out of that or make a business out of that moving forward, readjust. And this is quite bold what you're saying because we are here in Metro Victoria where businesses are smashed. True. And we both, obviously, I think you're similar to me that that's don't think that's very good. No. Uh, you know, obviously, Jim's very vocal Definitely about not. it. Okay, so we're anti that. Yeah. But what you're saying is quite bold. I mean, you would apply that advice even to those businesses who are suffering. Yes, I would. You know, I think we can't, you know, we can much pressure we can put on the media. Well, Jim's, I know Jim's done as much as he can from his point of view. He's done a great job. But, um, you know, what can, what else can you really do? You know, you can defy the lockdown like people have and get some PR for their businesses, which is fantastic, and people rallying around and supporting him. Mm. Um, but if you're not, not inclined that way, what other option do you really have? Adapt. Adapt. I think adapt. I think use the time now to adapt. Um, you know, adapt, adapt your business. Adapt yourself as a person, you know. Maybe reevaluate yourself, wow. what you've done in your life, to sort of go, 
and, and that's you know, relationships not working or whatever it is yeah. and then uh, use this time now to make a big change because there's there's no other time like this is going to be again so it might be the only opportunity people have to make the change right now you're going deep Joel I'm trying to do you reckon I'm, that... I'm rambling on a bit I'm <laughs> listening to myself I'm going jeez I'm trying to I'm trying to work out how to make a sentence and things like this and yeah, I'm rambling yeah, on you're the guest it's good it's good <laughs> Yeah, you're right, though, that this will probably never happen again. I don't know. Maybe it will happen again. But I feel like this is a once-in-a-lifetime yeah. thing. I'm, you know, my mum never saw the... Well, she's dead now, but she never saw the war. She lived in this Goldilocks zone between 1950... She was born in 55 mm. and she died whenever, 10, five years ago. Nothing really happened. Mm. Yeah, well, it's a once-in-a-lifetime event. And, um, you know, our kids will never... will go like, we'll never know what it was like. You can tell them as much as you want, but they're never going to know... Mm. That Melbourne was barren, you know, in the streets, or there was everything was closed. You couldn't get a beer at a pub, and and things like this. So, did but, you hear four hundred thousand? I think four hundred thousand people have left. I can't. I don't know yeah, if that's well, that's right. Queensland will be very happy. They'll probably all go up to Queensland or wherever they are. They're already, you know, they're already half of Victoria's in Queensland anyway. So, there's um, that guy on the yacht who sailed out during the lockdowns yeah, from the Melbourne, Melbourne businessman, yeah, up to Brisbane. Well, good luck to you if you can do that. If you got a, if you got a super <laughs> yacht, you can do it. I'd be on the same boat with you. So, um, oh my goodness! But yeah, it'd be interesting to see how. You know, I'm hoping for for me personally, being from the country or growing up in the country, I'd love to see regional areas benefit from this, mm -hmm. and that's the way I look at it. Let's see, workplaces have finally had their hands forced. Where, mm. hey, we don't need an office, mm. yeah. And that's mm. with Jim. I remember before the lockdown, he used to say, "Can we do four days a week?" Or I'd flick through studies from Sweden saying they're going to four days a week, or they're doing remote in the traditional thing. Oh no, you've got to be in the office. Whereas, that's been absolutely uh, the myth now that you have to have mm. a. A big environment like that so do those commercial places get repurposed for something else that's actually more beneficial to society you know we don't know so. like what i was thinking about buying commercial real estate a okay. number of years ago yep. thank god <laughs> yeah, thank god you didn't yeah. i couldn't afford it yeah so um yeah but what do you think repurposing all these offices because there's gonna be a lot of ghost offices in in melbourne yeah i think i think wellness is a massive thing you know this term wellness is a massive industry gets thrown around and it's a lot of woo woo stuff but i think you know people's mental well-being being um, you know, can you can you make creative spaces, creative zones, people to go just de-stress? You know, more gyms, more exercise, whatever it is. I don't know. I'm just rambling on here, but um, in the cities, in the cities, why not more livable? Was it? We'd also need more people to live in the cities then. Absolutely, but I think with this, you know, if you can work from a regional area, I think the regional areas, you know, definitely gonna do better out of this. Yeah. I know in my hometown, Warrnambool, the house prices are, are going up and up, and oh. there's no can't get a rental there because people are just moving down there and. I think that's going to happen. Do um, so, you know who? What else is better in the regional is the the polys. Do you? I had Richard Reardon on here a couple okay. of days ago from Colac, was it? Colac. Yeah, yeah. They just talk straight instead of in circles. They do. Yeah. Be like me doing that talking in circles, but um, they are they are a bit more straight. Country people are different. You know, city people and country people are a lot yeah. different. I think they're more open. They're generally more genuine. I think. And then yeah. um, yeah. I hope the regional leaders get a boost in this. I think that's going to be the positive out of this. Mm. Is that um, people will start decentralising the workplace and they can hopefully work remotely mm. um, from other places and those spaces in the city get repurposed to actually something that's a bit more maybe useful, more for arts, more for music, more culture, I don't know, but um, we'll see what happens. Crazy time we're living in, hey? Yeah, it very is, yes. I think everyone's a bit nervous as to what's going to emerge. Yeah. Well, what are, you, what, are your, what are your thoughts on it? What do you think? Not many people, I don't know why, but not many people... To throw the question back at me during these interviews. Okay. They don't have to. I'm just, I'm just, it's very curious. Only two people have done it now. You and another business guy. And I'm wondering why, the, you know, the, the more, the guests who often go on shows, they, they don't. They like to talk about themselves a lot. It's everyone's favourite subject, isn't it? You know? And, um, but I, yeah, we only had a brief chat off camera before, so I don't really know you too well, so I'm actually interested to get you know better. So if it's on a live recorded thing, then so be it. So, you know, um, I, think, I think that uh, the world is changing, and I, I've been fighting for the culture. I really... I'm interested in politics and law, and, and I commentate on that. Yeah. But uh, politics is downstream of culture. Uh, culture is really where things are set. It's like that famous um, quote, you know, let me write the songs of a nation, I don't care who writes its laws. And so I'm most interested to see what kind of culture is coming out of this. So one of the big things I'm looking at is is uh, the division yep. of uh, our community. Masks are mandated right now. And there's this big thing about if you don't wear a mask, you're trying to kill grandma. But mm. only if you're in Victoria. If you don't wear a mask in New South Wales, you're just exercising in normal going to the shops. Yeah, I think, it's, been, I think it's interesting how Victoria views it compared to the rest of Australia. Yeah. Um, you know, I found this out with... I'll go on about Jim, but when we did the initial seven news thing, 
you know, barrage of hate in Victoria almost, and some good stuff, but the rest of the Australia was sort of behind us. Wow. Now, now it's sort of you know changing a bit in Victoria. You know, yeah. a lot more people behind his uh, push with it. Um, but I just don't know why Victoria views it this way and the rest of Australia doesn't. I don't know. Yeah, I've had a lot of people with different theories on this show about that. Yeah. But uh, yeah, my concern there is is when the mask mandate goes, what what kind of division have we left within the community? I mean, my wife's already afraid to go to certain supermarkets because even if you're wearing a mask and you take it down momentarily, yeah. people can yell at you because you've taken it down to do something. Yeah, well, you know, I don't know if, I don't know if I'm getting a coffee, you know, go down for a walk with the dog and get a coffee and you sort of a bit, you feel a bit guilty taking the mask off to have a sip. You know, it shouldn't be like that. So, but now we're conditioned that way mm. uh, via all the media we see, with, you know, this sort of stuff and people getting shouted down for not wearing masks. And mm. I feel sorry for those people who actually have a genuine condition who can't, mm -hmm. who can't wear one and people are just making an assumption and just feel their right to go and abuse someone. So, People are buying badges now that say, be kind to me, I have a medical exemption. There's, oh, a, there's okay. this page called We The Liberated on Facebook. They sell these badges. Okay. Trying to disarm that, that anger. Yeah, I just think, but I think if, you know, if you're going down to shout someone, you know, it's, it's you know, what are you, what are you doing? So, well, okay, so the commissioner, the chief commissioner of police here in Victoria said, if you see too many cars at your neighbour, call Crime Stoppers and report them. Now, okay, one argument... One side of the argument says, look, they're breaking the COVID rules, they're spreading COVID, they're killing us all. I get it, okay? I don't agree, but whatever, fine. But then the other thing is when this when COVID passes, what have you just done to to the street? That neighbor dobbing on that neighbor and that those we're we're sowing discord that's gonna last well beyond COVID. Yeah, a lot of distrust, isn't it? Um, you know, I was told I don't know what you told when you're younger, but I was told when I was younger, don't dob on anyone, right? You get a lot of trouble for telling on someone. Yeah. And that's sort of the the mantra I've always sort of gone by, the old, you know, snitches get stitches. <laughs> well, should, what do you do if it's, that, what if you do if you, if it's bad? Like, let's let's assume that there is like a big thing going over there and mm. COVID is absolutely deadly and they're spreading it, having a COVID party and it is, it is say, it, just assume it's really dangerous. Wouldn't you, shouldn't, I don't know, how, how do you balance that? Shouldn't we dob them in? I think a lot of people think someone else will do it, then they won't do it. Um... Look, it's a tough one. Is it, is it your responsibility? Well, we've been told it's our responsibility. We've heard it from the Victorian Police Commissioner to, to tell him. So, mm. according to him, you've got to do it. Um, will it really change anything? Maybe, maybe not. Um, me personally, would I do it? Probably not. That's just not my not my nature. Um, you would hope people are responsible enough to do it. And if they're not, um, that there'll be various checks in place um, yeah. to catch up with them. So, yeah. yeah. That was a pretty bad answer. But <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's a challenging thing. It makes me think of of with content. I've been struggling with how much to really, how much honesty. Okay. To give. I've just gone full honest, full vulnerable, and and I don't care. But can you overshare when it comes to content production, especially if you're a brand like gyms or? Good whoever? question. Really good question. Um, I think you can. I think you're not going to show if there's bad stuff. You're not going to show that, right? But yeah. um, I definitely think you can. Yeah. Um, but I think you can undershare as well. And what I mean by undershare is you just all you produce is really well produced short clips of targeted, you know, message stuff. I think there's a balance between it. Um, What's but more common, undersharing or oversharing? Undersharing. Okay. Um, undersharing because everyone has to outsource a production company, you have to work with the marketing manager, all these sort of things. Whereas with gyms, we have in-house production, in-house media team, yeah, which is fantastic. It's the best investment we've ever made, in my opinion, in the company. Um, it doesn't cost overly much at all, um, and it's, it's been. And I don't know why more companies don't do it, but um, I definitely think you can overshare. It just, it just, if if you overshare and it hurts your brand or hurts what you do, then obviously you've gone too far. What's oversharing? Well, it's a good, it's a good question. Because um, we're not talking about the social, uh, what do you call it, the uh, virtue signalling, which right. which people, especially Aussies, they see a company trying to virtue signal and we slam them. Mm. But that's not what we're talking about. That's just bad content. Well, oversharing, over yeah. Yeah, well, I think with us, we the thing we overshare probably a lot is, I'm sharing it again, is our franchisees can walk away if they pay a certain amount of money. And our franchisors hate that because a lot of our franchisees, they're, they're, they don't know their contracts overly well. Yeah, yeah. And that's like most people. But they once they learn that they can just take their clients for a certain amount of money. Um, it's not much, right? Jim told it's me. It's not much at all. Four or seven grand or whatever yeah, it is. It's yeah, it's not much at all. And then um, Jim just openly says a lot on Ask Jim. And yeah, yeah. I get, that's the only negative I get from the Ask Jim stuff is that comment. But, um, oh, because it hurts the franchise. Yeah, well, the franchisors, you know, because the franchisee might not have known about that uh, and then they go and right, leave, right? Right. And they'll blame it on us. So yeah. that's an example where... You can't where... win by hiding facts. I agree. It is a fact and it yeah. is and it's definitely well known. But um, that's an example where oversharing has hurt us for an, exam for an example. Um, what about a restaurant? 
So right now, one of Gary Vee's advice is, and you're in lockdown, you can't serve anyone. What you can do is get out your phone and you can film everything, like every dish on your menu, film how you make it, talk about pasta, why is it good to boil pasta this many minutes and not that many, you know, really get into it. Mm. But then what happens if you're sharing on social media, like they see your bins and I don't know, just your internal workings of a restaurant and someone yelling. And Well, that's his old wine library thing he formed, right? Going on about wines and, and, yeah. and that sort of thing. So yeah, well, yeah, would you, you obviously wouldn't show you cleaning the kitchen or, or maybe you would, I don't know. Um, you know, oversharing. Look, it's still still going to be contrived if you do whatever. If you do share in that aspect, and mm. um, it's a good question. You sort of stuck me on what my answer would be. Oh, look, I think you do. If you overshare where you know the feedback hurts your brand or hurts yeah. your stakeholders, then you don't. That's you've gone too far. Okay. What constitutes the actual oversharing content? Yeah. Could be anything, in my opinion. Could be something about the contract. Could be right. something personal about the founder. Could be whatever it is. The reason why I ask is because this whole bit of business innovation series I'm doing, I'm trying to encourage businesses to get out there and just make, make, sure. make, make. Okay. So film bloody everything, yeah. right? And post almost bloody everything. Mm. But then I guess some of them will be fearful on uh, oversharing. Yeah, okay. Well, to, from that point of view, I, sh- I remember the brief, the brief in the email, which was that. I, I think, well, I, I, I don't think you can probably overshare mm. in terms of content and, and what you put out there. Mm. Uh, what you put out there, obviously, you might want to control some aspects of it. You don't have to show everything. Mm. But putting something out there, I think you just have to do it as a business now, mm. whether it be via your phone, you hire a couple of uni guys to come in a day a week and film your workplace or whatever it is. Mm. Um, but I think, I don't know if oversharing is the thing. I think knowing what you've got or what your product or service is, is actually people that are interested in. Mm. A lot of people don't think it's interested in. It's like, well, why are you in business? Mm. Show what you do. Be proud of what you do. Be passionate about what you do. Have someone just film what you do. And a lot of people, after a while, they warm up to it. So we've got a mm. franchisee who I use for a lot of stuff. Really hesitant at the start. Now he's calling me, hey, I've got a job. Do you want to come out and film this? Hey, like, nice. well, I get that all the time now. Yeah. So I think people just need to get comfortable with the fact that they're filming their business operations. It's the new norm. It's yeah. the new the new sto- way of telling a story rather than writing a, writing a bunch of content or yes. having a couple of you know, fake pictures with some models who aren't even a part of your business yeah. for photo shoots. You know? mm. Behind the scenes, look, phone here, just chuck it up. And that's what I'm trying to... I've got a lot of friends who have got some businesses um, and that's what I've been trying to get through with them really slowly. Yeah. It's still taken a while, but I think the business who's actually do it full throttle, apply that Gary V type of model to a, to a, an industry you wouldn't think, they, they do really, really well. Who is who, who's doing that? Uh, there's a company... There's a company... Uh, there's a guy running for me called Nick Rushton who was big in the nightclubs. But I, I think, know Nick. Yeah. Well, yeah. I think his brother's got a, a company and they do a... If you look at their Instagram, it's bloody good Instagram for a a HR company or for they're doing a lot of COVID cleans now and they use that platform properly they're always behind in schools you know doing their things and probably probably should go in a bit more detail than what they do but um, that's that's a business outside of gyms who do it really well Um, whereas in gyms we just film we just film everything and put it up and it's a great way to engage our stakeholders and and make people who research our brand or use our services actually know what we do but they're one example that I've seen them do I'm just trying to think of another good example of someone who's applied the gravy content model well why are you thinking of that um, you know uh, one you did really well was um this is to encourage people that stupid seemingly stupid content mm-hmm. is actually amazing you had just a real bushy area at the back of jim's hq yep some overhanging leaves and whatever and i just watched a guy for 30 minutes just clean the gutters <laughs> like yeah. what clean the climate ladder clean the gutters talking about how to put your ladder yeah i'm like you know fascinated and then he he blows the the ground and trims the trees. Yeah, there's things like that. That's um, excellent. Yeah, well, the other the other probably one that I think I don't know if you've seen. Have you seen Jim with the sledgehammer? No. So basically, Jim got a rower. He had he had this idea and asked. He had a rower which didn't work, and then basically he wanted to smash it with a sledgehammer, and we okay. then filmed it. So okay. all about customer service though, because their customer yeah. service with Harvey Norman was really bad with him, so he yeah. wanted to show it. So you know, we did a video like that, and Jim literally got a sledgehammer and. Yeah, it's a pretty good clip actually. Smash the sledgehammer okay. on the machine and things like that. How did he lift the sledgehammer? He's such a weedy little skeleton. He is. He did. He surprised me. It was. I bought the heaviest one. I could have around hundred bucks. He reimbursed me, which was good. Unlike him though. Um, <laughs> I bought a. I bought a twelve kilo sledgehammer, and he got yeah. it up to my surprise, and um, he did really well. So, that's a good one. But I, I just think a lot of people want to overthink their content, mm. overproduce it. You know this is going to be the script, this is going to be the messaging. I'm the complete opposite with it. And it probably my boys get annoyed with me because I just I operate in Slack and 
I've got an idea for this and that's it. You know, this time, this is it. This is all we need to do. Mm. You know, very really, really minimal run sheets, mm. things like that. I'll get there. I'll meet the person. I'll make them feel comfortable. I'll make them feel excited about what they do. Mm-hmm. People are interested in, mm-hmm. and then once you get them going, um, you, they come to you with ideas, and away you go. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if that answered your question. I don't think it did, but I'm just I'm just having fun, Joel. Cool. This is the funny thing when you get to see people on 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 the internet on TV mm-hmm. beforehand, you kind of idolize them a little bit. Well, I don't know, there's this is an image in your mind and then you meet them in real life, you're like, oh my God, oh my God, they're real. They're real. <laughs> yeah. Is there anything else you want to talk about? Um, well, I don't know, what, what can you ask? What, what haven't I sold you? Oh, you that's good. I, I like... think we've covered it. I just wanted people to know about create content, yep. get out there, do it. You're doing it, I'm yep. doing it. It's fun. It starts hard, it gets easier. Yeah. Um, I think definitely getting easier thing is, is definitely does. You know, you'll be embarrassed by what you do at first. And I look through our Instagram and stuff and... I'm embarrassed by what the we... quality. Absolutely. Yeah, mine's crap too. Mine, mine's garbage. Well, not oh. garbage, but it was just like mine's it was crap. just me in the office doing my normal job, plus going around taking pictures or you know yeah. whatever it was. And yeah. And as you get going, as long as you improve, that's the main thing. Yeah. Um, and you have fun doing it. It happens quick too, right? It does. The improvement for me it was a couple of months. And it was way better. Yeah. Well, I, well, I think you. Well, when did you get through the barrier there where you what sort barrier? of made it a habit? A habit. Oh, I um, set myself a challenge of. Uh, Seven days of content for seven days. Just do it because yep. to get that muscle going, come up with something every day. So seven pieces, they were yep. pretty crap. Then after that, it became for months, five a week. Every weekday, put something out online. And then after a number of months, I got good at it. Now, why did you, now was it because people liked it or because you saw the interaction growing or why did you keep doing it or just you enjoyed the actual process? I got so much hate. Really? I get hundreds of thousands of views on the stuff I do now, on the yeah. big stuff I do now, yeah. and love, 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 tiny, tiny bit of hate. Mm. Back then, I would get sometimes no, nothing, no good, no good likes or whatever, but somebody saying, this is the most uninformative, useless video I've seen mm. my entire time on YouTube. I'm like, oh, sorry. Like, it's free, it's not monetized, not selling anything. Yeah. But you kept going, man. That's the main thing. I kept going. So a lot of people don't. I remember don't I, did, there, yeah. I did my LinkedIn video back in the day trying to use LinkedIn and posted some video about using Instagram or something, had all these good things and then one comment really got to me and mm. you know, I didn't end up posting something for another two months. You know, and, and that was you know, that shouldn't be that way. So you just gotta basically look at, you know, what what's that person, who is that person, you know, the Gary V thing, what you know, what type of person has to go and write something negative or They're about, broken. S- about someone, you know. Yeah. You know, they are broken, there's something wrong with them. And they wouldn't say it to you in real real yeah. life anyway. So yeah. um, it's just one of those things. But once you get over that fact and away you go. But I think yeah. the main thing is people don't think they're interesting. And I think oh, okay. I think a lot of people underestimate how interesting they are. Yeah. Um, and I find from talking a lot of people and being in your shoes when I ask them questions, um, everyone's got an interesting story to tell. Everyone's job I think is interesting, whether it being a bricklayer, yeah. whether it being a waste waste removal, you know, owner. Uh, every everything is interesting to someone as well. Don't underestimate your audience. I reckon maybe everyone is interesting, but they're not everyone is good at telling their story. True. I'm a poor storyteller. I'm sh- I'm not a good storyteller. I don't think so. Um, that's why I like the live interaction sort of stuff for me. Whereas I can just yeah. questions and answers and thing like that. I'm not a good storyteller. Whereas Jim's a great storyteller, yeah. and that's why I think our content does pretty well with yeah. Jim. Is because he's naturally a really good storyteller, yeah. um, and very engaging when he talks. So that's something I'm trying to work on and trying to piece a story. And how can I say it best in my head? But um, yeah, you get better as you go. You know when you talk about LinkedIn. Yeah. Um, have you noticed what I've noticed? Something? I want to know if you've seen yep. it too. I feel like there's a lot of expertise on LinkedIn. It's oh, yes. Amazing people on there. Mm. But I feel like the ratio of original content to reshared content is way skewed. Everyone is just sharing an article, sharing yeah. an article, sharing. And I'm begging my contacts on LinkedIn, please, for God's sake, create. Just get a camera on yourself. You're a judge. Put a cam- You're a leading criminal barrister. Like, I want to hear your thoughts. Yeah, Why yeah. the hell am I, no, not even a lawyer, explaining the omnibus bill? We should be hearing from this scholar and this dean of, and all this kind of thing. What's the feedback you get, though? What do they say? Most of them don't answer. I've, I literally tag right. them in the post and say, I, friendly, I would watch any channel, anything you ever create in our list, like 10 people, great people. Mm. And no one, people just, they like it and they move on. I think people are scared. They are scared. They probably are scared, yeah, because you've got to put yourself out there, right? How, how many of us really truly put yourself out there? Mm. You know, not many people do it. Mm. Um, can you truly pull yourself, put yourself out there and keep getting criticism and keep going like obviously you did with your, mm. your early videos mm. and, you know, you see where you are. But a lot of people truly don't put themselves out there. We all have facade. You know, mm. it's hard to pull that facade down. Mm. Um, you know, what are people going to think of us? And that's what holds us back. But you don't get anywhere with that mentality. Mm. Um, but obviously, they're very successful people. They've got somewhere. They are somewhere. They're, yes. They are somewhere. Yes. But um, 
just I don't know why is it whether they're scared to open themselves to criticism or they can't deal with negative feedback. The resharing of content's interesting. You know, people yeah. reshare something, get a hundred likes on a reshared bit of content, so you can be lazy. Yes. Yeah. You know, original content's hard these days. So. Well, maybe that's the thing. Like what we've been describing, is original content really is uh, vulnerable. It unveils who you are, and a lot of these it people does. are hiding. It does. I think a lot of people are hiding, um, and I think a lot of people don't think they're worthy enough, and they have that imposter syndrome, which we hear a lot of, and yeah. think they're a fraud. Um, LinkedIn's an interesting one. I've met some people who I've followed on LinkedIn in real life, and it's a massively different from what I actually see in real yeah. life. It's, it's very disappointing, actually. Or even just compare LinkedIn profile to the Facebook profile. And yeah. You're not the same person. Yeah, not the same person. But even when you meet him, it's very underwhelming a lot of the time. Am I underwhelming? No, you're definitely okay. not. <laughs> definitely not. It's okay if I am. No, definitely not. Oh. I'm, I'm worried about more myself because um, no, I'm you're, 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 rambled on a bit. You're what but, I expected. That's, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. Uh. But, but I think, um, you know, being having that continuity with who you are in person with your online image, I, I've, I've really met people like that. Obviously, your stuff's... You're very, from what I see online, completely complete the same. But um, you know, I think Jim's like that. Uh, but I think a lot of people on LinkedIn and those platforms, there's a lot of mm. disconnect, and it really frustrates me because they claim about being authentic, being genuine, and stuff like that. That's like, big on LinkedIn. The word authentic is huge now. I use it myself, but it's they, they posture. They do posture, and um, yeah, it's just it's an interesting it's an interesting platform. Mm. Um, you know, and you get the old DMs all the time. But I think mm. meeting some of those people to actually what they present online it's just taught me. Obviously, don't believe anything you you see online. Uh, you know, I'll judge for myself when I meet someone and mm. the value they can provide me if that's what they're trying to sell me or whatever. But um, it's definitely been underwhelming meeting some of the people who you think are LinkedIn influencers compared to what they are online. You know, it's been underwhelming for me meeting MPs. Okay, right. Well, how many you met? More more than five. More than five. And what's what's what do you think's well, what's underwhelming for them, for you about it? I was scared to call MPs at the beginning of this Victorian lockdown stuff. Yeah. No, only a couple of months ago, August. Uh, it's just not something I did. And now I, I'm telling everyone to call them. I'm calling them. I'm interviewing them. I'm chasing them down. I'm, I'm all this kind of stuff. Because I've realized how flawed and normal they are. Not just normal, how rubbish some of them are. <laughs> really. <laughs> so, enough, right. and, and, you know, because we're all rubbish in certain areas of our lives. But we see these people on, on, on media and, and MPs and we, we kind of hold them to a higher standard. Maybe we should, but... To find out that some of there, there are some there are some donkey MPs and there are some brilliant MPs and mm. there are some nice ones and some horrible ones and some ones that are kind of they talk at you and don't listen to you and then there's other ones you feel like they they could be your best friend and and that's really been strange for me. Well, is it because you put a let's say a reverence on the on being a politician? You think that's a position you should hold in reverence or not anymore? No, I think what we're, what we're observing is is this whole content thing we've been talking about as we're, we're starting to peel back the facade i think two things one the facade is falling because people are doing long form content yeah. and i'm interviewing them and whatever but second of all people are demanding the facade to fall i think there is a demand for for authenticity <laughs> uh for, out there in the community and and what we're discovering is the emperors often have no clothes mm. it's like the tide's gone out and we're seeing who was swimming naked and a lot of people were yeah, and, and sort of one of those. It's it's, but it, but saying that if, if they are their authentic self in the public, will they get to a position where they are? Probably not. Probably not. And that's Some the, of them and, know. and that's the thing we need to realise as as the public that we, everyone is got got faults and it's got you yeah. know is everyone's like each other. Yeah. And um, that's why I don't think anyone's done it because I you know, I think someone like Jim or someone would be fantastic for politics. You know, if yeah, you meet him, but would, um, yeah. you know, he wouldn't get anywhere because he would say what he thinks and then. No, but I'm saying that they would like Jim okay. and Richard Reardon who was in here right. the other night. They're so real. Well, maybe think... maybe we're ready for that. I don't know. Maybe we're ready for it as a as a public to sort of maybe put one of those people into a into a position because we yeah. sort of go we vote that way because we want the authentic or the person who actually is genuine and, and says that what they think if we agree with them or not. Yeah, but even we'll, if you think yeah. they're crazy. Like you got Craig Kelly out there. Yeah. Such a hero amongst so many, so many people hate him, but so many people love him. And that's the point. I think we're getting more authentic people. Yeah, more, well, let's say more polarising people. More, more. I think you've got to be polarising as well to do well. And in my, my opinion, is that yeah. sort of stuff. And yeah. maybe, you know, that polarising person, you know, that overly polarised person, yeah. you know, can they get to a position where they can actually have some, some real influence? Hey, what do you think of Dan Andrews uh, content production? I haven't really followed it too I much. Haven't, to be I haven't. I've, I've seen. I've seen obviously the ad with what was her name, Magda Magda Sabansky. Yeah. Just because people talk a lot about Dan, how he's very well managed and social, he does TikTok and everything. I haven't seen his TikTok. Obviously, his Twitter goes all right. You obviously oh. have these 
these people are just loyal allegiance followers. We've had a few of them come on Ask Jim's and and spam the sort of the page almost. Then um, he's got a good little team, I presume, working for him. Social team. Yeah, social team doing his Twitter and stuff like that. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I, you know, this is off topic, but I just, I just don't, I just don't think he's got much empathy, to be honest, from what I've seen in those press conferences and things like that. I just don't see how you can um, have all this sort of destruction going around you and you know just be so shut off um, and be so hard lined. But Joel has yeah. got to save us from coronavirus. Apparently he is. Apparently he will, and that they'll be he'll die on that hill for his you know next. Real. I've got no idea about politics, so he'll be a lot more intelligent than me in that area. But um, yeah, I just think he's doubled down on this, and that's it. You know, there's no you can't show me any evidence to stop me from doubling down on what I think. I think that's going to get me re-elected, and that's what he's doing. So. But Jim's is reopened now, right? Hundred percent reopened as of today. Uh, not all of them. Our cleaning franchisees, cleaning group franchisees. Oh, because it's indoors. Indoors. They can't go in the home. So we have a lot of cleaning franchisees who, obviously, that's all they do is residential and commercial. They can't do anything. But mm-hmm. most of our guys now uh, and girls are back at work, which mm-hmm. is good. But the cleaning group ones still have to wait a bit longer, I presume, mm-hmm. yeah, which, is a bit, which is a shame. You know, I met a couple of franchisees who actually started their business just before before lockdown. Mm-hmm. You know, they've got no income. so And they do cleaning, COVID cleans and things like that. So, You know, Adam and Weave Barbershop, uh, so Harry's clothing opened and got yep. a fine illegally. The, at, and the following day, Adam and Weave Barbershop opened yep. and got a, in Werribee and got a fine. Their story was interesting. They're from, I think, Syria. Okay. And they had a barbershop, if, wherever it was. I think it was Syria. They had a barbershop over there that they had to close due to the war. Yeah, it was Syria. They had to close mm. the war. And then they came here, opened this, this hair salon a few weeks before the stage four lockdowns in Melbourne. So they're not eligible for any job keeper, job seeker, relying on the savings and, and the yep. love of the community. And so I kind of get why they opened against all restrictions. They're desperate. Absolutely, you're desperate. If you know you've got no money, you know, what can you do? Are anyone in gyms just mowing lawns? Well, I mean, that's legal now, but there must have been people. Some people did through lockdown. They just kept yeah, going. They kept going, and, and you would have thought the public would have said something to them. No one said anything to them. No one dobbed them in. No one, no one did anything to them. Well done, Melbourne. Yeah. yeah. I, I presume we had a few franchisees like that, but um, we obviously said don't, don't do that, you know? Sure, you say it, fine, but... but yeah. Good to hear. They're just mowing the lawn by themselves. Yeah, some of them people did that, or you know, if they did dog wash, or or even cleaning. You yeah. know, we don't know fencing things like that. So yeah. they still got to earn, earn some money, and that's what they've got to do. So they did it. Um, yeah. Obviously, we say, you know, do everything what you what the government says. And mm-hmm. but um, if they did that, they did that. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Joel, thank you for coming in. This has been a great conversation. There's a clock behind you, your shoulder, hour and a half. Well, I hope you got some value out of it. I didn't know. I'm a bit shocked you asked me to actually even do this. So I'm tired um, of talking about coronavirus. Yeah, yeah. And I wanted to talk to someone who understands content production and Gary Vee and... I hope, I hope I do a little bit. I'm, I'm just a Gary Vee guy, so whatever Gary Vee does, and I, what I consume as well, I actually try and replicate. So there's the probably a good example is that um, I love love soccer, football. Um, there's a show called Soccer AM, yeah. and they get the coaches down in the plays to type in, to Google themselves, and mm-hmm. they come up with the top 10 things that about themselves, yeah. and then they tell it truthfully, you know? So okay. I'll see that and I'll go, let's do it with you, Jim. You know, top 10 search oh, careers on Jim like Penman. Busting the myths. Yeah, oh, yeah. Man. So is Jim real? <laughs> you know, yes, I'm real. You yeah. Know, does Jim have a wife? Yes, I've been married yeah. for 14 years, happily yeah. married. Yeah. You know, is Jim is Jim, is Jim alive? You know, so is, is alive. Jim alive? Yeah. Yes, I'm still here, <laughs> thankfully, you know? So, but that's that's done then just to make the framework to business, mm. you know? It doesn't mm. have to be all business serious stuff. We try and do some funny stuff as well and, it's stuff that I like. A lot of sporting, I think sporting clubs, digital media departments are probably no. right up there in mm-hmm. terms of the originality and stuff like that. So why can't you apply that to your business? So we sort of take, you know, 10 quick questions with a franchisee now. Why not show a public, it doesn't have to be your him selling, you know. This is Aaron, he's a local expert in your community, which a lot of people don't think our franchisees are actually local business owners where they are. Mm-hmm. Uh, Na- Aaron, you know, what's your favourite footy club, Collingwood? You know, how long you believe in the area? 10 years, you know. You try and let people know buy some entertaining content that, you know, they are local business owners. Mm. Um, you know, and that's via a funny channel. Whereas sitting there going, you know, I'm Aaron, I'm 34, blah, blah, blah. You, you try and do things that are fun. So, What a good way to end. Um, I think there's been some great advice for businesses that we've talked about today. I hope so. Well, I've rambled on a bit. And then um, I sort of, I, I didn't, I'll tell, be honest with you, I got up at um, 5 a.m. because I couldn't sleep because I was running through my head answers I'm going to give. And I don't think I gave one of the oh, answers I, too nervous. I gave. I was. I didn't give one of the answers I think I gave in my head. But, um. Uh, thanks for having me on, and just hope if anyone gets any value out of it, um, you know, then that's great. Um, I just think, you know, people just get too up in themselves and be, you know, be scared about, you know, what people are going to say. Just do it. If you've got something to share, share it, mm. um, and then refine as you go along and just try and be a little bit better. And uh, who knows where you'll be in a year's time? You know, if you said to me two years ago, I'd be doing, 
you know, videos with Jim and things like that, I would have said, you know, you're dreaming. So um, just one of those things, just, just, just produce, everyone's got something worthwhile to tell. Put it online, you never know what that could uh, create, what that could lead to. This is good advice, people. Uh, conversations that on this show that go for 20 minutes is because we I don't like them. We run out of things to say, but when they go for an hour and a half, as we just hit, uh, Joel is exactly who I thought he would be. Really cool guy, uh, great insights, big hearted, which is nice, and uh, that's why I wanted to stay for lunch. We're going to eat some roast, charcoal roasted Before lamb. For the protein. Get back for, I can't go to the gym, so I've got to get the protein the, the other way now. So. Thanks for coming yeah. in today, Joel. No, thanks, Matt. I really appreciate it.